ahead and start the recording for the session. I know a lot of people couldn't make it tonight, but I want the recording to be available to them, as well as if you want to go back and rewatch at a later time, it will be available to you. And Jasmine should post that. Jasmine or Dr. Arnett will post that to the YouTube channel typically. And I also sent this study guide to Jasmine, and she should be posting it on the eLearn or sending it to you via email if she hasn't done that already. So lab midterm is 30 questions. So kind of similar to the range of what you would see in lecture. And they are either all multiple choice and there's a few matching. So nothing that requires like free response essay questions. That's out of the question in bio 130. Everything is typically multiple choice or matching things that you see in lecture and also on your pre and post labs. So that's just a little background about that. It also opened yesterday and it's open until Friday night, right? And I know I forget the time. I think they give you like one to two hours to take the exam. So plenty enough time to work through those 30 questions. So that shouldn't be a problem. And what I did is I, I went through the exam and pulled out the major themes and concepts that you need to know to be successful on this exam. So I thought we could just kind of talk through these. And definitely the more that you participate, the better that you'll do on the exam. I can almost guarantee that. We have statistics to back this up. And I also wanted to say that if you need more concrete examples or like you want like a practice test, actually, please note that there is one in your lab manual, I think on page 127. And it is very similar to what you will actually see on the exam. And I don't think there are answers provided in the lab manual, but if you have a question on one of those questions, you know, please feel free to email me or kind of tell me here and we can take a look at it. But definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first couple of things that we should be clear on going into this lab exam, and this was kind of your Chex lab and the Alka-Seltzer lab, so knowing the differences and like the ultimate definitions of observations, inferences, and hypothesis. So can somebody just briefly tell me what an observation is and how that is different from an inference? And feel free to unmute or type in the chat. And if you don't know, just tell me and we'll have a discussion about it. Okay. Yes. So observation is something that you take in with your senses, right? You know, you you're watching something happen, maybe you hear something, you taste something, like you're actively involving your senses. And it's just happening in the environment and you're describing it exactly as you're describing it. So like a qualitative description, right? Now an inference, on the other hand, is, you know, maybe I have an observation and I have like little pieces of evidence and I put those pieces of evidence together to form sort of like a conclusion. I infer that from, I infer something from the pieces of evidence that I'm given. So with an observation, you directly state what's happening. You know, it is, the sun is shining outside. Like I don't have to do anything special, no pieces of evidence for that. It's just, I'm seeing that with my eyes. But with an inference, you're typically taking little pieces of information, putting them together to form sort of like a conclusion. Okay, does that make sense? Like the difference between the two? So observation, very simple, like almost the basic form. 
And then inference requires like an active process and putting pieces of the puzzle together. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, perfect. So then who can tell me what a hypothesis is? Because this is very important. We did this in lab, we did this in lecture. So you should 100% know what a hypothesis is and requirements for a good hypothesis. So who can tell me about that? Good. So the requirements for a good hypothesis, the hypothesis must be testable and falsifiable. Very good. And remember what a hypothesis is, right? It's that educated guess that's based off previous observations and maybe even tests that we put together. So yeah, I'll definitely know the difference between those three things because you may either see like a definition question or like you know an applied scenario question but if you know the definitions it will guide you to the correct answer okay and then following on from that hypothesis you should know the steps of the scientific method right so we also touched on this in lecture as well as in lab so usually we observe something from the environment that gets us thinking and asking questions. And then based off our observations, we form a hypothesis. You know, if this happens, then this will happen because of such and such principle. It's typically the format for those hypotheses. And then of course, perform an experiment so, you know, put the hypothesis to the test because we already said that a good hypothesis must be testable and falsifiable. Then from our experiment, we're going to analyze the results. So look at the data. What does the data say? And from the data, form conclusions. And this was ultimately your Alka-Seltzer lab, right, where you got to, you know, form a hypothesis, design an experiment, test it, analyze the data and then form the conclusion so that was your scientific method lab so you should definitely keep that in mind because you might be asked to you know look at a graph and interpret the data from like an alka-seltzer lab and kind of see what it's telling you okay is everybody clear on the steps of the scientific method and you may also have to put them in order because remember, we said matching and multiple choice. Good. OK, so another thing that we need to be clear on are the different types of variables and groups that we can have in an experiment. So who can tell me what the difference between controlled variables and a control group is? Like, what are the differences between those two? Because I know that that is a common source of confusion because they sound very similar and they have the word control in both of them. Right, so the control group is the group that does not receive the treatment or whatever the treatment is, you know, that could be back to the fertilizer example. If we're testing the effects of fertilizer on plant growth, we need to have some plants that do not receive the fertilizer. That's our control group. And we have some plants that do receive the fertilizer and that's our treatment or experimental group. Good. So then what are controlled variables? And why are those important? Good. So controlled variables are kept the same across groups. So if we were looking at the effects of fertilizer on plant growth, the reason why we need controlled variables is because it allows us to say, OK, this specific variable causes change and it's the only variable. So in order to say that fertilizer increases plant growth or changes plant growth, 
we need to keep the soil the same. We need to give both groups the same amount of water, the same amount of sunlight, and things of that nature. And those are examples of controlled variables, but they're kept the same across groups. Very good. Okay. And then also the difference between an independent and a dependent variable, knowing how to identify those in a study. And I know that we've talked about it in lecture and in lab, and you've done quite a bit of e-learn homeworks on that. Is everybody clear on the difference between the independent and dependent variables? Excuse me. Okay. So remember that the independent variable is usually the variable that is manipulated directly by the researcher and it usually causes change in the dependent variable. You know, that's why it's independent and the dependent variable is dependent because it's dependent on the independent. You know, if, you, if that makes sense to you. And the dependent variable is the variable that's usually measured in response to the independent variable. So back to our example of the effects of fertilizer on plant growth, you know, the presence of fertilizer or the absence of it, so, you know, control treatment group, that's our independent variable. You know, the researcher is direct, directly manipulating whether or not there is fertilizer. And then the dependent variable is the plant height, let's say, in centimeters, because that's what's being measured as a result of changes in the independent variable. Does that make sense to everybody? how to differentiate between the types of variables and the groups. Okay, sounds good. So we'll just keep moving along then. Next up is the biomolecules lab. So what you'll need to know for each of these are those indicators or those reagents that you've used such as Benedict's solution or reagent, the iodine solution and the burette solution, and what they test for, right? And what a positive test looks like, as well as a negative test, and like all of the values in between. So for example, for Benedict's reagent or solution, which tests for like simple carbohydrates like, like glucose, like sugars, a negative test is blue, right? And a positive test, you know, is anywhere from like, you know, orange to reddish. But if you have a lot of like glucose or a lot of sugar there, what color is it typically? If you have a really high concentration of sugar, it's red, but specifically brick red, right? So it's like a really dark red. And if you don't remember like the colors and like what they indicate, then you need to go back to your lab manual and kind of look at that because you may be presented with a scenario where it tells you that it has so much percentage, for example, glucose. And if it's like a very low percent of glucose, but the glucose is still there, then it might be like an intermediate, like an orange, as opposed to like a brick red if there's a lot of glucose. Does that make sense? Or if like I have starch in solution and I do the, the iodine test, what's going to happen? Especially if I have a lot of starch. going to turn black, right? So it gets really dark and that indicates a positive test. So definitely familiarize yourself with that table and what the colors indicate because you may see a couple of questions about that on the exam. Okay. Another thing that I wanted to address really quickly is the difference between a positive and a negative control. A, when you see the word positive control, that just means that it's basically a positive result or a positive test. So if you are asked, 
what should you use as a positive control for Benedict's reagent? A positive control is always going to give you like the positive result. That's why it's called a positive control. So you would use something like glucose, right? A simple carbohydrate. Or if you wanted a positive control for the iodine test, you would use something like starch because it's always going to give you a positive test. On the other hand, the negative control is the exact opposite. It's always going to give a negative result. That's why it's called a negative control. So if I wanted to see a negative test for like the Burette test, I would use, you know, something other than a protein, you know, because it's going to give me blue if it's something other than a protein. So something like glucose, for example, would be a negative control for the Burette test while something like albumin, which is a protein, right, would be a positive control because it's always going to give you a positive result. Does that make sense to everybody? And feel free to totally tell me if it doesn't make sense. You know, that's what these sessions are for, to help you understand. So if something is not clear, please let me know. Yes, of course. So what I was saying is knowing the difference between a positive and a negative control. A positive control is used in an experiment because it gives like a comparison. A positive control is always going to give a positive result or it's what the result should look like. So for example, for Benedict's reagent, we know that Benedict's reagent or solution responds to simple carbohydrates like glucose. So that means that if I want a positive result, I can use a positive control like glucose because that means Benedict's reagent is always going to turn, you know, like orange to red. It's always going to give a positive result. While a negative control is the exact opposite. A negative control is a comparison used that gives a negative result. So let's say if I had a protein and, you know, I was going to combine that with Benedict's reagent, what would happen? We would have a negative test, right? Because Benedict's reagent only indicates carbs. So with a protein, it would always be blue. So that's just kind of like a comparison that we can use to kind of see what's there. And if the test is working. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So definitely go back in your lab manual if you don't remember like the color indicators and study that. Okay, functional groups, they never go away. So can you all tell me um, especially like what these look like? So a hydroxyl group, what does that look like? Right, definitely remember that. So that's the OH group, right? So you may see a question or two about these functional groups. So it's really important that you remember them because they will appear in lecture and lab continuously. And then remember for lecture, we have a cumulative final. So you should always keep these in the back of your mind. What about a carboxyl group? and a carbonyl group, like what's the difference between those? Because they look really similar and they sound really similar. Let me see if I can draw on this document. Okay, so for a carboxyl group, Remember that we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and then an OH group sticking off of that, carboxyl. And then for a carbonyl group, 
Remember, it looks very similar, but instead of the OH group, we just have a hydrogen. And you know, when we saw these in some of our biomolecules, right? Our carbonyl, we typically seen in the carbohydrates, right? And then for the carboxyl, we not only seen these in like amino acids and ultimately proteins, but we also saw them in our, you know, fatty acids that made up our lipids. So definitely make sure that you're clear on those groups and what they look like. So maybe go back to your notes from lecture just to look at them. Okay. So journey of a protein inside the cell. So this was basically this past lecture exam. So who can tell me like the major organelles? So obviously that are involved in protein synthesis. So we know that DNA starts in the nucleus. So that's where everything's going to start from. And then from the DNA, we're going to make RNA. But after RNA leaves the nucleus, where does it go to be made into a protein? Right. Yeah. Rough endoplasmic reticulum or rough ER, right? Because that's where the ribosomes are at. Or it can find a ribosome in the cytoplasm, you know, the, a free ribosome, but it has to find a ribosome, typically on the rough ER. Okay, after we get translated, so our RNA is translated into a protein at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where do we go after that? So what other organelle is involved? And what is its function? Right, so the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. And what does the Golgi body do to the protein? Right, so it modifies, packages it. Remember, the Golgi is like our post office. So it's going to make the protein nice and pretty and get it ready for transport and then it's going to leave the Golgi in that transport vesicle right where it can be carried to wherever it needs to be whether it exits the cell or you know goes to another place the Golgi tells it where to go okay is that clear for everyone so you might have to um, select the right order kind of like you had to do on the lecture exam of the route of a protein inside of the cell. Okay. So another thing along the lines of tour of a cell, you will also have to possibly look at an animal cell. And if it's pointing to like an organelle, you'll have to identify that. Normally these are like the really big ones, like the nucleus, the nuclear envelope, endoplasmic reticulum, um, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, like those really big organelles. And I would definitely know their functions as well. Another couple that I would know the functions of are the lysosome and the peroxisome, which I know we didn't really get to talk much about those in lecture, but we, we did hit them some and then in lab as well. So who can tell me what lysosomes and peroxisomes do, just generally? Okay, right, so lysosomes break down biomolecules in general. So, Yes, they definitely do that. And peroxisomes actually break down things as well. You may have heard Dr. Arnett refer to these as like the garbage disposals of the cell. So if something needs to be torn down and recycled into like individual components, it's going to go to the lysosome or the peroxisome, which contain a bunch of enzymes that break things down. Um, hydrolytic enzymes, if you're a lysosome, and then peroxisome involves hydrogen peroxide which helps break things down so just generally knowing the function of those 
And then what are vacuoles used for? So we typically see those in plant cells, but does anybody know what they're used for? That's another thing you may see on the exam. Right, for storage. So vacuoles, when we talk about vacuoles, we typically talk about uh, water storage, like in plants. But vacuoles in general are just for storage. Okay? So yeah, I would definitely, to study for this part, I would just pull up a picture of an animal cell. And if you can, you know, point out all of the organelles and just briefly give the function, like, oh, I know that that's the rough endoplasmic reticulum and that's involved in protein synthesis because it has ribosomes. Or that's the Golgi body and I know that because of, you know, it's over here by itself and it has cisternae and it's involved in modifying packaging and transporting proteins. If you can do that, you should be pretty well prepared for this part of the exam. And you may see a couple questions on that. Okay, so membrane transport. So some things you should consider when you're studying about membrane transport. You should consider the nature of the membrane. So what is the cell membrane made out of? What forms the lipid bilayer that makes up the cell membrane? Phospholipids, right? And when we talked about phospholipids, remember we said that they have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. And those hydrophobic tails are, you know, much larger than that little phosphate head. So the membrane is pretty much nonpolar, right? It's a lipid. So we know that like dissolves like. So our Nonpolar or polar things going to pass through more easily through the cell membrane. Okay, so if like dissolves like, then nonpolar molecules are going to pass through the membrane more easily. So things, for example, like glucose, which is a carbohydrate, and we know carbohydrates are polar, those are not going to go across the membrane very easily. So they're typically going to require like a protein, maybe through like facilitated diffusion or something like that. So keep that in mind. Another thing that you may see, which you also saw on the lecture exam, is a question about a selectively permeable membrane. You know, it gives you the U-shaped tube where you have water and solutes on both sides, and it says the membrane is selectively permeable to water and glucose. Um, what's going to happen to the water level or something of that nature? So just be familiar with your rules of simple diffusion, and osmosis. Remember that things are typically going to move down gradient from an area of high concentration to low concentration, which is passive transport. That's going to happen automatically. And then they're eventually going to do that until they reach equilibrium in which, you know, it's going forward and backward at equal rates. And that's what solute equilibrium is. And then also with osmosis, remember that that is the free diffusion of water and that water always wants to be where the solutes are. Okay. So you, you, I think there's at least a question or two on a scenario like that. So make sure you practice. And then just knowing the differences between passive and active transport will help you tremendously in lecture and lab, of course. So we already talked about passive transport. So who can tell me what active transport is? Like what's the definition? Right, it needs ATP or it needs cellular energy. And remember, that is because we're moving against the gradient. 
So typically going from an area of low concentration to high concentration, and that's why it requires the energy. Very good. Okay, what about extragonic and endergonic reactions? Who can tell me the, the difference between the two? Right, exergonic releases energy, right? Okay, what about, so for example, when you did your uh, lab where you, you know, burned food and you were looking at the transfer of energy, right, there was release when the food was combusted or burnt, so something to think about there, and endergonic consumes, right, or it absorbs energy. It requires an input, something to that nature. Very good. Okay, so that is pretty much it for most of that. And then your photosynthesis pogol, which I know probably seemed to go on forever. It was very long, but very informative. So is this an endergonic or an exergonic reaction? Right, endergonic, it requires that input of energy, that light energy to get it started. Good. And then you also learned about light independent and light dependent reactions. Does anybody remember where these occur? Like where does the light dependent reaction occur and then where does the light independent reaction occur? In the chloroplast, right, which is our plant organelle that's ultimately going to be responsible for photosynthesis. Okay, light dependent reactions. Okay, yeah, right. Light independent is in the stroma, right? And that's where the Calvin cycle happens. And then the light dependent reaction occurs in the thylakoid, right? Okay, so you should definitely be familiar with that. And we're going to start that in lecture on, well, tomorrow. So hopefully that'll help you study a little bit for you know, this exam and for the lecture exam as well. Um, which of the following, so the light independent or the light dependent reactions is carbon dioxide or CO2 involved in? Because it's only involved in one. Okay, remember that takes place with the Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction in the stroma. So keep that in mind. Does anybody know the products of photosynthesis? Like what's produced as a result of photosynthesis? There are three products. Okay. C6H12O6, glucose maybe, so sugar. Um, we also have water produced and oxygen, right? And that oxygen is what we breathe and we exhale carbon, di carbon dioxide, which the plants use to make more oxygen. That's the circle of life. So keep that in mind, those products. Okay, what happens to the ATP? So the energy, as well as the NADPH produced during the light dependent reactions. Where do those go? Okay. So remember that those produced in the light dependent reactions, the ATP and the NADPH is going to go over to the light independent reactions. So they're kind of intertwined, right? So make sure you study photosynthesis, okay? And be clear on these points especially. Does that make sense to everybody?
Okay. So that is pretty much all that I have for you. So we have this study guide. Definitely go through it. Make sure you're clear on all of these concepts and that if asked a question relating to them, like we discussed, that you can answer those, especially these ones down where the photosynthesis is. Make sure that you're clear on what's happening in those types of reactions and where they're occurring. Does anybody have any questions? And yes, I will send you the PDF and Jasmine should be posting it on the eLearn page so that you or she'll send in an email so you can have it. Okay. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Okay. I'm going to stop the recording.